Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Steve Wilson from the State Water Survey, um, manager of the private well class. And today we're doing a webinar, um, is my water safe to drink? Common questions about private wells. And again, um, uh, we're at the State Water Survey at the University of Illinois. Um, we're, the private well class is a program that's funded by RCAP, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, uh, through funding from US EPA. And uh, it's with their support that we're able to put this on, have our class and do all the things we're able to do to support well owners. Um, thanks for joining us today. So about the webinar today, um, it is part of a national program that's been implemented through RCAP, uh, again, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership uh, to support private well owners. It's a national program. We work in every state and RCAP has staff in every state and boots on the ground. Um, before COVID, they were putting on workshops um, they're still doing well assessments for folks, which I'll mention in a minute. And um, they run the book, basically the in-person part of the program, and we uh, handle the online side of things. So um, this material today in the webinar follows our private well class, which is a 10 lesson class, which this webinar is not one of the 10 lessons. Um, people seem to be confused by that, but if you go to our webpage and I can show you at the end, uh, there's a place to sign up for our class. It's actually um, a PDF of 10 lessons. It's sent you sent to you once a week for 10 weeks and um, <clears throat> provides a lot more detail than we can get into in our hour and a half today. So this is being recorded and it's being made available on our YouTube channel and through our class. I'll also show you how to access that. The reason is, you know, many of you ask questions today that we're going to try to answer um, as many of those as we can. Um, Every webinar we do has questions like the ones you all asked today. And so it's really worthwhile to go through those videos and uh, look at the questions at the end uh, for each of those. Uh, a lot of times they're different on topics you may not even been aware of. And uh, we've already went to the trouble to answer those for you. So um, there will be time at the end for follow-up questions. You have a chat box or a question box on your GoToWebinar menu. Uh, Katie uh, Buckley is with us uh, and is monitoring that. And she's making a list of all those questions and we'll just pull them up at the end and we'll go through them uh, for as long as you're interested. And I do wanna mention uh, as for the last uh, five or six months, um, we have had all of these issues. I do have a nine-year-old at home um, who may just decide to interrupt us. Uh, my neighbors mow their yards. We did have internet uh, outage in one, one month and just a lot of other distractions. Uh, that may come up that you can't anticipate when you're sitting at home. So uh, bear with us if, if any of that occurs. So as far as CE guidelines, continuing education units, um, our program is approved for NEHA credit for sanitarians or environmental health professionals. They use a two-year um, accreditation cycle. So you can only get credit for this webinar if you're uh, uh, looking for NEHA credit once every two years, depending on when your cycle starts. So for an example, if your credentialing cycle ended on 73020, which means you started a new one on 81, you can only take this class once in the last in the next two years um, for between 81 and 73022. Um, so um, down in the bottom right corner, I've listed all the uh, dates that we've already done this particular webinar. And again, it's the same core content, which is the first half, not the questions, but they don't count those twice. And so um, we're also an Illinois LEHP credit provider, and you can email us, and there's our email address to get that information. Um, we've had several folks uh, that are environmental health professionals from around the country ask us about becoming a provider in their state. Um, what I can tell you is in some states, that's quite a job to become a provider. And it, uh, we just don't have the bandwidth to become a provider in every individual state. We'd certainly love to. Um, and so for the states that offer NEHA credentials, uh, we certainly, um, and that's probably the biggest thing we can uh, and do, and we work with NEHA pretty closely. So um, in your handouts that are on your GoToWebinar thing, um, you can download the certificate of completion, the safe work sheet, and uh, the drink, safe to drink agenda and um, email us if you want a copy of the slide deck at the end or the completed NEHA forms and uh, we'll take care of you. Um, give us a little time 
Um, because of COVID, uh, we've seen an uptick in the number of folks taking these classes. And, um, and so um, again, we have a pretty small staff. And so it takes us a little bit to get through all that. So with that said, I just wanna mention, um, I'm a groundwater hydrologist at the State Water Survey. I've spent my career um, working with well owners and groundwater, source water protection issues, uh, water contamination related to natural occurring contaminants like arsenic and uh, some of those issues, as well as helping well owners and small water and wastewater systems through um, our sister program, wateroperator.org. And Katie Buckley is uh, working on this program as well. She's an outreach specialist and um, she will handle your CEU needs at the end. And also she's taking the questions today and handles all the logistics for these webinars to make it, uh, it seamless for me. Um, so uh, I appreciate all she does. Um, I do wanna talk about RCAP for a second because if you're a well owner and you have questions about your well, RCAP has staff in every state. These these are their regional nonprofits that make the RCAP network. And um, you can call any of those. Here's their numbers. You can contact us and we'll get you in touch with someone. I do that a lot actually when a well owner contacts me um, and from some other state and says, you know, I've got this issue, blah, 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 blah. Um, we contact the RCAP uh, private well person in that state and they'll give you a call and may actually come out and do an assessment of your well for you, which is completely free. Um, and I'll talk about that here uh, probably next. And so, yeah, um, we got together about five years ago. Um, I brought together 14 people who are all private well experts from different um, areas of the industry, if you will. Sanitarians, drillers, um, state regulators, um, hydrologists, and, uh, and, and uh, we put together this assessment tool. It's um, it asks a lot of questions about your well. It's something that's meant to be filled out one-on-one -on -one between a well owner and a private well expert who can fill out this out. And it asks a lot of questions about how you use your well. Um, they do this on site so they can uh, look at your well, see if it's properly constructed and protected, point out things that might be a deficiency or things that you might want to be concerned about. Um, if it's, you know, if it's in a low-lying area susceptible to flooding or, you know, if it's all corroded and the well cap is an old coffee can, which we run into a lot more than you'd realize. Um, things that just make it unsafe or likely that, you know, insects or snakes or other things can get in your well um, and then give you um, a set of recommendations at the end on uh, what you might want to consider uh, changing or upgrading or be concerned about. It's completely free. This is again funded through US EPA and they provide the funds for RCAP to go out and do these assessments. And in some cases, um, the RCAP staff are actually working with a state agency that may not have the bandwidth to go out and do an assessment when someone calls them like a state public health department. Um, they may ask the RCAP staff to go out and do the assessment for them and help the well owner just because um, you know, the way things are today. Some states are uh, underfunded, especially through their health departments and may not have the adequate staff to deal with every private well uh, issue. So it's really a great service. Um, it was developed by a group of experts, including, I mentioned, didn't mention Extension, but Extension had a big role, in, um, especially in a few states where they're really active in private well issues and getting this uh, put together. So I certainly, it's something, if you're interested in, uh, you can contact us and we can get you in touch with somebody. Um, and what it is really, it's like if you're, if you're a health professional or a someone who works with community water supplies, then you're familiar with a sanitary survey. Every community water supply has to have a sanitary survey done every three years by law under the Safe Drinking Water Act. It's really like a vulnerability assessment to look at the plant, um, their distribution system, uh, their wells, if they have groundwater wells for their supply, and to help them understand uh, where they might have uh, things that uh, they need to upgrade or do better. But we created some kind of a similar uh, tool for private wells. It's not binding. There's no legal requirement. It's really meant to educate you as a well owner about your specific situation. And when I say that, um, realize that almost every individual well is different from every other individual well. Even in a subdivision where all the wells were drilled very similarly, they certainly have a lot in common. But um, you know, it depends on where you're at on the landscape and a lot of other issues. 
you really need to deal with your well on a one-to-one -one basis to understand uh, what your particular issues are. So this tool allows uh, someone from RCAP who is a well expert to come out and talk to you about your well, promote best practices, why you should sample every year. And it also uh, gives you a chance to ask questions about things like, uh, one of the most common questions we get is, I tell people to contact their local health department. Sometimes people will say, well, if I contact them, what if they tell me I can't drink my water? Well, there are a few localized health districts in the Northeast where they can actually do that. And they may have that authority, but in 99% of the country, your local health department is there to help you. There are no rules statewide uh, regarding uh, the quality of your well water. That's why well owners are on their own and why you need to be educated about your well. And so it's a chance to provide that communication answer those questions and just specifically about that one issue if you're concerned about your health department having any kind of authority to tell you you can't drink your water that's the first question you ask them when you call them um, do you have any are there any legal requirements if you provide me information or i have you do a water sample where you could condemn my well um, and like i said there's a very few limited health districts that do have that authority um, the only ones I've come across are in um, Massachusetts and they, another Northeast state, I can't remember uh, offhand, but it's uh, because they've created their own ordinance for that. But everywhere else in the country, um, your health department's there to help make sure that your drinking water is safe and will work with you as much as they can, but they can't tell you what to do. Okay, got off track there, sorry. Um, so for the uh, assessment program, it says 1800 here. I didn't update this slide. They've actually probably done closer to 2,500 of these assessments around the country, which is great. It's As a program, it's done more good than um, many that have come before it um, because of the number of people we've been able to help. But 18 or 2,500 out of an estimated uh, 17 to 20 million private wells in use in the country is still just a drop in the bucket. So um, one of the things our program has really worked hard on is working with stakeholders that actually do work with well owners and reach a lot of them locally like sanitarians or realtors or labs. And so one of the things that we've done is held this workshop. We've done over 50 of those that are mostly led by RCAP staff. Um, it's a four hour workshop where um, they learn about using the assessment tool and how to do outreach to well owners. And it's worth CEUs and it's led to our training uh, over 800 professionals about how to use the assessment tool uh, that we develop. And that's now been moved to our um, responsibility and we hold one or two of those a year and we'll probably do one later this fall. Um, it's a four hour online workshop, uh, which sounds really uh, not fun, but we try to make it a little more fun uh, to do that. So um, the other advantage is RCAP has been able to develop partnerships through uh, other groups, not only health departments, but uh, local civic groups, even watershed groups or others who are trying to protect well owners. There's a group in uh, the northeast part of Illinois called BACOG, which is a group of seven communities that all have private wells. And um, they do a lot of outreach on their own to help their well owners understand why they should protect their aquifer. And so RCAP and in Illinois, the State Water Survey is working with those kind of groups as well. So a little bit quickly about the water survey that most of you have never heard of. Um, every state has a state geological survey, but Illinois and now Oklahoma are the only states with a water survey. Oklahoma started about 10 or 15 years ago. Ours started in 1895. It was originally um, created by our state legislature to document water quality because of cholera and typhoid outbreaks that were the kind of the norm at that time. And so the water survey's first mission was really to establish sampling protocols and working through noise lab at the University of Illinois, developed um, ways to test water and um, identify with communities that might be at risk. Uh, you know, sanitation was much different back then. Water treatment was non-existent or very uh, in its early beginnings. And so um, that's how we started and we've been doing that kind of work ever since. Um, as an example, this is an investigation water survey did for Pena, Illinois in 1916. There were 30 some odd cases of typhoid and uh, our job was to go in and figure out what caused it only half the town was sewered. Uh, they just built a brand new water treatment plant that was expensive to run, so the mayor wouldn't let the water uh, people run it. So they were using untreated water. 
and uh, we were sure that was the case. It turned out that the Pena Ice Cream Company, which also sold milk, um, had one big vat that seven different farmers put their milk in, and everyone used the same bucket to get their milk out And uh, when they bought milk from uh, the ice cream company. And that was the source of the typhoid. It lasted about a month and a, a little over a month, I guess. And uh, through investigation, we're able to uh, deal with that. And there are many cases of this in our files where we've went in different parts of the state where cholera and typhoid were a problem um, before, you know, disinfection and some of the common practices became common um, that we take for granted today. Um, so um, here's just another picture. Um, I'm fortunate I've been at the survey for over 30 years. And so um, I'm working on archiving a lot of our old files. And so this is from New Athens, Illinois in 1912. And when you look at that lab kit, uh, there's a microscope there and everything you'd want in modern times. Um, but boy, I bet that was heavy <laughs> to carry around and sample. And we were doing this all over the state at the time. So getting to our topic today, um, things to remember as a well owner, private wells aren't regulated. Um, and that's true, as I mentioned, in over 99% of the country, once they're installed and once they've met uh, the state's criteria for um, drilled properly and proper construction. Um, and so it's really up to you as a well owner to make sure your water's safe and that your system is maintained. You're really like the water operator of a very small water system, uh, like a community water supply where they have to have the licensed operator and all those things, you're on your own. And you can't judge water by the way it looks, smells, or tastes. It can be the best tasting. Uh, my dad used to always say that about our old dug well. Boy, it tastes so much better than city water, but you can't go by that. Contaminants can be odorless, colorless, or have no taste and you really need to sample. And that's the message for today. Uh, many times, I'm sure, uh, we'll, I'll talk about the fact that you need to sample to really know what's going on. And you know, I'm not saying wells are unsafe because many wells are, are safe, but you have to test to know um, because there's a lot of potential contaminants out there. And um, I live on a city well now. Um, I, I live in a community. I get community drinking water or public water supply water, and I pay 40 to $50 a month. Now, as my daughter's getting older, that's starting to creep up into $50 to $60 a month. Um, but that's the cost spread out over our 150,000 residents for sampling, maintenance, infrastructure, everything to make sure our water's safe. And when I turn on my tap, I have water pressure and I have plenty of water. And that's your responsibility as a well owner, all of those things. And that's why it's important that you understand that. So uh, today we're really going to talk about what it means for being a well owner and some of the common questions that people have that are really the basics of being a, a good steward of your well and your well water. Um, you really need to understand your well log and where your water is coming from. And if you can, if you don't have your well log, you can investigate how to find that, look in your state records, uh, talk to the driller if you know who that is. Um, there's other ways even RCAP can help you with that. Um, but knowing the type of well, how deep it is, where the pumps at, how much screen you have, if you have a screen that's usually a sand and gravel well, um, the water level and, and the geology are critical to knowing what kind of risks you might have. And so um, there are natural occurring contaminants. We have places in Illinois where I've done a lot of research because there's high arsenic in our groundwater. That's not everywhere, it's in a few counties. You need to know if those things exist. Out east, you have a lot more arsenic issues in the northeast, especially. In, in, as well as um, uranium issues. And so some of your states have information about that. Uh, some of your local health districts will. Uh, you need to ask the right questions and what our program is really geared toward, uh, geared towards, excuse me, is helping you understand some of the basics you need to know so that you can ask better questions when you do contact local sources for information. They're the people who are gonna be able to help you the best because They've worked in your area for a long time. And again, sample your well. That gives you so much information uh, about your water quality and what issues you might have, including things like corrosion, or, or if you have an older home that may have lead, knowing uh, the pH and some of the other uh, constituents, alkalinity of your water, tell you whether it's even at risk of corroding in that lead or not. Many lead pipes will not corrode because the water chemistry doesn't support it corroding. You just need to know those things. And so you may have lead pipes and it's not a risk to you at all. Um, but the only way to know is to sample. So um, 
As far as testing, that is the big question we get. Um, every month, um, every email usually has something to do with when to test, where to test, what should I test for, um, how do I know where to get it analyzed, how often, all those things. And so we're going to go through that uh, in a little detail today. And first of all, about collecting the sample. So um, what you're usually drinking is the water out of your kitchen sink. And that's maybe ran through a filter, a, a softener, or maybe some advanced treatment like an RO unit. But it's chemically different from the water that may be from an outside tap that's coming directly from your well. That directly from the well hasn't gone through the pipes in your home, which may be copper or PVC or lead. Um, and it hasn't gone through any of that treatment I mentioned. And so the water chemistry really can be different. And what we do, and one, a good lab will give you detailed instructions on where to collect the sample, when to collect the sample. Like for bacteria, you have a 48 hour holding time if you're gonna meet um, you know, the standard required for at least community water supplies. And so a lot of times you, they'll tell you to collect it the morning you're gonna bring the sample in so you can get it in, um, or if you're overnight shipping it, those sorts of things. And just an understanding that you have treatment, all those things can affect what the water quality is. So um, our lab, which the water survey has a lab, uh, we, until 2006, our state legislature funded our lab such that we could provide a free water sample to any well owner in the state for inorganics and metals. Um, that since changed, it's still subsidized, so it's pretty cheap, um, but uh, it's, not, it's not free. Um, but what we do, we use that information also for the research we do and for understanding the groundwater quality, not just your drinking water quality. And so most of the time, we ask well owners to collect two samples. One at a kitchen tap, which is where most of their drinking water is coming from, if that's the case, and one from an outside spigot or hydrant where it's before any treatment and it's coming straight from the well, um, or it hasn't been through um, most of the pr premise plumbing or the plumbing in the house. So the outside tap is representative of the well water or natural groundwater, um, much more so. And so that gives us information about the water quality in the ground or things like natural occurring contaminants like arsenic or uh, even pH, uh, some other issues. And the kitchen tap is representative of what you're actually drinking because it's going through your softener and everything else if you have that. So they, and again, as I said, they can be uh, significantly different. And I'm gonna show you an example real quick. So this is a well owner uh, near Champaign, uh, Illinois, where we're at. And uh, this is their outside spigot. And what I wanna point out here is uh, the sodium in the first column, the last thing there is 25.9. Um, on the right side, down near the bottom, the hardness is 351. And uh, right above that, the turbidity color and pH are listed uh, as 29.8, 48.1, and 8.02. So um, this is without any kind of treatment. This is their natural groundwater quality. They actually let this run for 20 minutes so that we're sure that we're getting water that's the pump's kicked on and it's directly from the well and hasn't had a chance to sit in any pipes. Okay, so they have a filter and a softener. So it's an iron filter um, meant to take out uh, in a uh, five micron filter, I guess is what it is actually. Um, and so, and then it's run through their softener, which exchanges, makes a water softer, but it uses sodium salt to do that, right? So in this case, it changed the sodium from 25.9 to 198. So if you're on a low sodium diet, um, using regular softener salt, uh, that sodium base and not potassium base, could be increasing the amount of sodium intake you have if you drink a lot of water, that sort of thing. But look what it did on the other side. It, uh, the turbidity and color and uh, pHs are basically the same, but the hardness went from you know 350, I think, down to 0.68. So their softener is working great, is the message here. And they've also, um, all the less than symbols on this I mean it's below the detection limit for the lab. And so many of these things are below detection limit um, because they're just not in the water and that's fine. Um, so they also added in 2015, which is why he had the sample collected an RO unit. So he took a sample after the RO unit, the reverse osmosis unit, which is meant to take out many things. It doesn't take out everything, but you can see the number of less than arrows has really increased. Um, so that there's you know the turbidity and color below detection limit, the hardness is you know below detection limit, and the sodium has even been reduced significantly. 
Um, what has changed though is the pH. Some of the buffering uh, things in the water that keep the pH in our natural groundwater in Illinois um, around above seven and a half, in this case it was eight, is now down to 6.23. So if you're in an area where, um, and this is an extreme case, there aren't many of these, but some folks have put in a whole house RO unit. Um, we don't typically recommend doing that unless you have a really good reason um, because it's, it takes a lot of extra water. Uh, RO wastes a lot of water um, and it's also really expensive. And so it wouldn't be the smart thing for most homeowners to have a whole house unit. But if you had a whole house RO unit, then all the water is going through your pipes has been reduced um, and the pH may be low to start with, um, you could be causing corrosion problems in your pipes just by using an RO unit, which is an unintended consequence, just like the high sodium is. And so it's good to understand your water quality and have someone who understands how to interpret that, uh, look at it so that you um, are sure that you're not by adding treatment. Um, and I say that because I've gone to folks' houses to do assessments where they've got uh, a basement full of treatment devices. They had the means, they decided they just treat the heck out of it so they know their water's safe. Um, you know, that's not necessarily a, a good idea or necessary. And it's good to have the information first before you make those decisions and spend that kind of money. Because the one thing about treatment systems that um, I hear a lot from professionals, and I mean even health department folks or state regulators, is most people forget that they have maintenance on their treatment equipment. They have to change filters, they have to change uh, sleeves or whatever. And if you don't take care of those things, they can become the source of your uh, bacteria problems or things like that. They have to be maintained properly. And so there's an ongoing expense if you're gonna add treatment and that's something to be aware of. So what do you test for? Well, every situation is different. Depending on the type of well you have, how deep it is. Um, if you know the formation, the water's coming from, what's known. And so um, again, it's always good to ask your, you should have any here local as well. I'm used to Illinois where we have county health departments, but out east, many of the states are local health districts that are set up by community. And so there isn't a, a county health department per se. Ask your county, local, or state health department for advice, and they can tell you if there's any contaminants of concern. And you know, ask extension, your neighbors, even your driller or other drillers, um, what there might be in your area. Like the state water survey in Illinois and the state geological survey or DNR in many states, they have a lot of information about source water quality um, or if your department of public health. Um, some maybe have stuff online. So the bottom line is, um, you need to tailor your sampling to your your uh, potential needs. And uh, there are folks who can help you with that. And so, um, and again, sample for coliform and nitrate annually. So they're, they're there, they're called indicator uh, contaminants. Um, nitrate is certainly bad for babies, um, but it uh, it's still out on the fence about how dangerous it is for adults, but it's easy to test for and it's fairly ubiquitous in the surface environment in the United States. And so if you have elevated nitrate, it means there's a pathway into your well. Same for coliform bacteria. That bacteria is a surface contaminant. If it's in your well, it means it got in there from the surface or from nearby surface from a shallow groundwater source that has access to the surface. That could be cracks in karst topography in the geology of the rock. It could be from a nearby septic system or a livestock field. But if you have that in your well, it should not be there in a groundwater system. And that means there's a pathway into your well from the surface. And that's why everyone suggests you test for these things annually, because it's a way to check that your well integrity is still in place. A couple examples. Uh, Rhode Island has this on their website. The uh, little uh, polygons or, or dots everywhere are where there used to be orchards that in the, until the 50s or 60s were using arsenic-based pesticides and how many of those soils are contaminated. And the thing to do there, if you're in an area where there might've been an orchard, find out if there was, you could have soil-based contamination uh, that eventually seep into groundwater for arsenic. Um, the reason I show this example though is because of that big splotch in the middle. Uh, Rhode Island has a unique geology where they have natural occurring beryllium. And when I found this you know, seven years ago or so on their website, um, I didn't realize that beryllium was actually a regulated contaminant under the Safe Drinking Water Act. That means that communities have to test for it 
and make sure it's below a certain level in order to serve it to their customers. You as a private well owner, if you're in Rhode Island in, the, in this area, you need to test for it to see if you have it or not, and then determine whether or not um, it's high and elevated and if you need to treat for it, because um, no one's gonna do that for you for one. But uh, the point is, there are resources available and here through the Rhode Island Department of Health to help their well owners understand where there might be a risk and what contaminants might be risky per se. And, there's, and, and it's really helpful. I, you know, I would have I learned a lot just from uh, going through this website. And so it's worth your time uh, in your state as well. So uh, another example, this is Massachusetts. They have a high level of arsenic and uranium in some of their bedrock. And so they've developed this website. They've mapped all that. Um, they know where there's high levels. And so you can enter your address and it will tell you if you need to consider testing for arsenic and uranium. And then they also provide um, uh, maps that give you zones if you don't want to put your address in and labs that can test for it as well as fact sheets on why those are concerned. So again, this is helping you as a well owner. Uh, there are resources out there. And DNR in Wisconsin, uh, has taken the data they've collected on private wells and worked with the University of Stevens Point, which is this watershed science and education group um, center, I guess it is. And uh, you can go on here. I clicked on arsenic by county and it's given me this map. And so um, the counties that are clear, you can see underneath the land uh, uh, surface stuff, means there's no samples for those counties. The ones that are uh, the majority there, I think are green means it's less than five micrograms per liter on average for the samples they've collected in those counties. Um, there's one that says none detected, but then you have areas near Green Bay where it's red, which means it's over 21 parts per billion or micrograms per liter for arsenic. The Safe Drinking Water Act regulates community water supplies to maintain arsenic under 10 parts per billion. So those in red and yellow um, and the orange would be over that. And so communities are probably treating in those areas if there are sinks that high. It doesn't mean it's in the whole county. It means that's the average and that's the way this particular website set up. But how valuable is it to you as a well owner if you live in Wisconsin to be able to click on this map and look at all the contaminants and see if it's anything you might want to test for or if you're moving to uh, Wisconsin to, uh, to the Milwaukee area or you know Green Bay or uh, Madison, wherever, to be able to go in and say, I'm, you know, I want to test my well before I buy a house, which is a whole other uh, set of things we could discuss. But um, you should test your well if you're going to buy a home. Make sure it's the way it is. Um, so anyway, it's just a really valuable tool. And hopefully we'll start seeing more sites like this one uh, that states uh, put up for us. So here's what we suggest. We suggest, again, annually for coliform bacteria and nitrate. Now, Penn State Extension has a really great program for private well owners in their state. And I listened to a talk last week by Brian Swistock, who runs that program. And he mentioned that they suggest 14 months for well owners who are actually gonna test every year. And it makes a lot of sense um, because the idea there is if you always sample at the same time, especially if a shallow well where it's affected more by uh, the elements or by the season, um, you know, wetter in the spring, drier in the late fall, summer, um, if you stagger it over four or five years, you're going to be testing uh, at different times of the year, and it gives you information as a well owner uh, that may suggest levels have changed or they're higher in certain parts of the year. And then you can kind of hone in on when you're at most risk if you are. Um, if anything's like nitrate gets elevated, say in the late spring, then that's when you'd want to test for that uh, to see what you know the maximum is there, that sort of thing. So it's just uh, something I hadn't heard before. And it's uh, probably not a bad idea uh, just to move it out uh, to 14 months so that you're sampling at a different time. And that may give you information you didn't have before. But the rest of these things here, we recommend testing every three to five years uh, for a series of inorganics and metals. And the point there is it gives you a good idea of the water chemistry. And uh, you know things like copper, you want to test for if you have copper piping and zinc and cadmium, if you have galvanized piping, which also has lead. Um, but these are uh, what we would recommend on a national scale. And then going to the third bullet, then also ask your local or state health department. You know, we wouldn't recommend uranium for everyone in the country. We wouldn't rec recommend beryllium for everybody in the country. 
but we would have recommend beryllium if you're in Rhode Island. And so that's something to talk to your state or local health department about because they have better information and data on what's been found in your state. And that's why, um, you know, it needs to be a team effort. And uh, the one thing I should say to you is like the folks that call me or email me directly, I answer every one of those, but so will your uh, folks in your state. You know, if you call your state geological survey or your DNR or your health department or whatever agency is working with source water or with uh, drillers uh, licensing and well construction code, if they don't know an answer, they'll help you find an answer or find someone who can. Um, and it's worth developing a relationship with all those folks uh, just because you'll learn more and you'll understand your aquifer and you're not, uh, every time there's a newspaper article that says, you know, something outlandish, you don't have to be really concerned um, because you know that's really not an issue. For instance, um, we've had well owners contact us because of the community nearby has had a boil order and not understanding that a boil order is because they've had a pipe break in their community and now their water could have bacteria in it and it has nothing to do with their source water or the private well that might be an hour, a mile or two out of town. But those folks could learn a lot if they would uh, do their due diligence, uh, learn about their well, their geology and all those things. And that's the whole point of why we're here. So uh, when to test your well? Well, anytime you've opened it, besides what we've already suggested, um, if you've had to disinfect it, follow-up samples should be done to make sure that it's still, uh, there's no bacteria. And then anytime there's some kind of an event, um, El Paso County in Colorado, they had a fairly large forest fire and we were working with them on a video. Uh, they provided the, the still pictures for a short video we have on what to do after a fire. Because certainly in some areas, uh, forest fires on uh, homes out in the country or in rural areas uh, can be a problem. Just like you can see these melted wires here, you know, if the power wasn't off to that well, those melted wires could cause the pump uh, to fire up and run continuously and burn up. Um, you could come home to not having a, new, a pump anymore, things like that. So um, you need to look at your well whenever kind of an event like this happens. Anytime it's flooded, if it's overtopped with water, you can assume um, that you should assume that your well, even though it has a proper well cap and is properly sealed at the surface, um, had water get in it. Um, because most of these caps have a gasket and unless you're changing that gasket very often, and like here in Colorado, or in this example in Colorado, every year freezing and thawing um, affect gaskets pretty hard. And so um, we find a lot of times that this cap has never been touched and it may have been five or 10 years. Well, likely the gasket has cracks in it and it really isn't watertight anymore. And so that's something to consider. As far as getting it analyzed, you know, we recommend using a certified lab. And what that means is they went through the hoops that are required by the state um, to be able to do compliance samples for community water supplies that have to meet the regulations in the State Drinking Water Act. And that just gives you some assurance that the lab knows what they're doing. Uh, you can certainly get samples done cheaper by a lab that's not certified, but um, our recommendation would be to use one. And the only caveat to that is there are a number of university labs that use all the EPA regs it's just they don't have uh, the dollars to stay certified because there's a big expense to that. And that's typically because they're doing programs like ours where um, you may be providing samples on a subsidized basis or even um, you know, just at cost to make it affordable for a well owner. And you know our lab is one of those, uh, Texas A&M, uh, Virginia Tech, and I'm sure there's others, Penn State, I think. Um, and so if you work with those programs, talk to them, be comfortable, familiar. Um, but in general, we would recommend using an accredited lab. And they should be able to give you all the details and instructions you need. If you need to preserve the sample in ice or how to store it, when to take it. Um, if they can't answer your questions, find another lab. And um, we actually work with the Association of Public Health Labs and I've had several webinars for those labs. Um, and you can find those webinars recorded on our website, if you're a lab person, on what we tell them they need to do. And I said to all the labs, I tell well owners, if you can't answer their questions, they should go find another lab. Labs that are gonna do private well testing need to have someone on staff who's knowledgeable about private wells, because uh, we've had many, many times we've had well owners say, I called a lab and they said I had to tell them what the sample for, they couldn't offer me any advice. Well, 
well owners are calling labs for advice. If they can't provide it, find a lab that can. Um, that's, that's just what I would recommend in general. And they should be able to provide you everything you need. As far as interpreting results, there are websites out there um, and documents that, rec that tell you, you know, most of the results um, are going to come related to the Safe Drinking Water Act, which I, again, will say private wells don't have to meet the regs of the, of the Safe Drinking Water Act. But most people, including us, recommend that you do because those are the levels that have been deemed safe for community water supplies to provide to their customers, which is most of the public in the country, right? So we always use those as standards, even though they're not enforceable, which is, you know, fine. It's up to you. We have people, uh, this area I worked in in Illinois where there's a lot of arsenic. I've had people who drank arsenic at, at 20 times the health limit uh, today of 10. And they're like, I've drank this my whole life. It's never bothered me. Um, I'm not going to change now. That's their prerogative because it's their well, it's their water, they can do what they want. Um, I tell them, what about people who come to your house, your grandkids? Um, do you really want them to drink this? It's because you think it's safe for you um, because it probably isn't and it's not for everybody. So uh, in the end, you can use one of these websites and I'm going to show you one because it's really well done. Um, but always take your results to your local health department or a qualified person, even your doctor, and get a qualified answer. And uh, we have certainly run into where um, doctors aren't necessarily aware that people are drinking water from their private well instead of a community water supply. Um, have them contact us. We can educate them about what they need to be concerned about um, related to, their, to the folks that they serve that have a well, because they really should be able to answer all your questions. So um, again, some other best practices, if you find something well, especially if it seems off, you know, really high value of something that nobody else around has, or it's really unusual, um, resample to confirm. And if you do a, uh, a bacteria test, a coliform bacteria test, then you should stop drinking the water and have an E. coli test done, which is a bacteria that can hurt you and boil your water until you can chlorinate your well or disinfect it and uh, you're sure it's safe to drink. So this is the tool I just mentioned. So the Department of uh, New Hampshire uh, Department of Environmental Services developed this with funding from CDC a number of years ago. It's a great tool and it's meant for the residents of, of Rhode Island, but anybody can use it. So, um, and they, they're aware of that. We had them come talk at our private well conference in 2017, just because I knew a lot of states weren't aware of it. Six states have since asked for this software so they can help develop one for their states and hopefully there'll be more of those online soon. But the way this thing works, it, it's meant, it's called the Be Well Informed tool. It gives you uh, guidance. Um, down at the bottom in the green here, it says, enter your test results. So when I click on that, up at the top on the right, it says New Hampshire town or city. It lists all the towns, which is every health district in New Hampshire. And it also has anonymous. You don't have to tell them where you're at. And that's why it works for anyone. And so it's meant to give them tracking information so they know especially for arsenic in New Hampshire, which is a big deal, um, by putting in your town, then they have another sample to add to their uh, set of samples, um, not a person, just a sample that's in that district so they can understand where the real problems are. And so it's worthwhile if you're a New Hampshire resident to certainly put what district you're in. I only put in arsenic, which is why it said invalid entry at first. Um, I wanna point out that there are other tools out there I would recommend using this one and you can just Google Be Well Informed Tool New Hampshire because one of the things that does um, that none of the others do is it asks you the units and it gives you a drop down. Most labs provide sample results in one specific unit and there's so much confusion over these units, um, me included, that um, it can cause a problem. Milligrams per liter is the same as PPM are roughly the same as PPM uh, in certain situations because of pH can be different, but micrograms per liter is the same as PPB. And that's what we highlight in green here is micrograms per liter. And I put in 15. If I put in 15 milligrams per liter, uh, that's 1500, right? 15,000, it's very high. <laughs> so um, add three zeros, yeah, 15,000, uh, which is, you know, the health limit is 10, micrograms per liter. So um, apologize for that loud truck. But the point is, um, we have a question. When you, when you sign up for our class, it's 10 lessons are sent to you once a week for 10 weeks. 
there's a pretest. And one of the questions is literally a conversion of units. Your sample result comes back as this value, say milligrams per liter. How many PPB is that? We've had um, we've had the the, the pretest is voluntary. We've had like 6,500 people take the pretest, and over 8,000 actually do the class. But of those, all those people, 6,500, about 28% got this question right. So units are a problem for all of us. Um, and that's why, um, one of the reasons why I really recommend using this. Most of the other tools out there, you have to convert it yourself, and that just leads to problems because it depends on what units the lab puts the results in when they send you the, uh, your results. So whenever you put in, I put in 15, the standard is 10 or 0.01 milligrams per liter, which um, here it shows you 15 micrograms per liter is 0.015 milligrams per liter and the standard is 0.01. So it says it exceeds the limit. It also recommends treatment. And so you can see here, point of use, arsenic absorptive media filter. It's like a filter that cartridge that can goes on your kitchen sink or point of use RO, which reverse osmosis removes it as well. Now, RO can be affected by the type of arsenic you have. There are two valence forms of arsenic, plus three and plus five, and it works much better on one versus the other. Um, and I don't want to misspeak, uh, I don't want to be, uh, yeah, I don't want to misspeak. And so I believe it's the more oxidized version that RO has trouble with. And so um, further below, there's information on treatment. And, and how to find the right type of information. Um, NSF is a National Sanitation Foundation in this case, and they list treatment, they're a third party certifier, so they can provide a list as, as well as a couple others, um, uh, Water Quality Association and, um, oh boy, Underwriters Lab, uh, all provide uh, recommendations or certification of treatment equipment. And so as you go down this page, you can see, um, that you can use NSF ANSI standard 53, which is for the media, the cartridge filter, or NSF ANSI standard 58, which is for RO. And so when you look for a treatment device, if you're gonna buy an RO unit to remove arsenic, you're gonna to wanna to look at the box and make sure that it says it meets NSF ANSI standard 58. It doesn't matter if it's got a UL symbol, um, the Water Quality Association gold seal, or an NSF logo, all three of those certifiers certify to that same standard. And uh, when you look at treatment equipment, if you get online then and Google a certain type of uh, treatment equipment, you're gonna see some that are, you know, that are three times as much as others. And I will bet you uh, in almost every case, the ones that are only a third of the cost don't have that seal on there. And so um, you don't necessarily know what you're getting. It's worth uh, the companies to do the certification process and you as a homeowner, it's worth spending more money to make sure you're getting something that's actually removing what you want to remove. Okay, um, again, these are only a guide. This tool, this uh, Be Well Informed tool from New Hampshire is a guide and it's for typical waters. You should always take your sample to your local health department or your doctor to get a um, qualified answer and find out what they recommend. Um, they are health professionals. I am not. I'm a paramotor hydrologist and a civil engineer. I know enough to be dangerous and I know what a real risk is but I'm gonna always send you there because uh, your health is something that you should have a professional uh, determine for you. Um, and no matter what, they can't tell you, as I mentioned earlier, except in that 1% of these local health districts, they can't tell you to stop drinking your water no matter what it is or contain your well. They can recommend it and they may strongly recommend you don't drink it, but I know from personal experience in Illinois, our health departments at our county level um, may say you really shouldn't drink this water. It's got you know 10 times the arsenic it's recommended uh, for, for safety, public health safety, well, some people are going to choose to still do that. That's your choice and that's your right as a private well owner. So, um, and it's uh, just remember, don't put, impose that on anybody else. As far as other things, uh, the biggest problems we see, in all honesty, there's two things. Poor well construction, because every time a state adds to their well construction code or creates a well construction code, they grandfather all the old wells in. I grew up on a well that was hand dug by my grandpa in 1933. When it rained, we had cloudy water. Um, I went home one weekend while I was in college and my dad said there were frogs in our well, true story. And so that well is still in use today. Um, it shouldn't be, but uh, some people are stubborn than others and believe their well water is safe. Um, 
But as codes have changed uh, and these wells were grandfathered in, we also find a lot of wells in pits. And in northern climates where you have frost in the winter, these pits were built before the pitless adapter was developed for inside the well to help make sure that your pipes didn't freeze. So your well was finished three or four feet below ground in a pit. That way it was below the frost line. So we still see those today. Um, they're not only a health issue, but they're a safety issue. And um, I show this slide. I know we actually had someone comment on the, the goat slide over here on the right. Um, this was in an old uh, well that wasn't being used and a goat made its way into it. And uh, they found it a few months later. Um, that's pretty disgusting, but you'd be surprised how many wells are open. The one on the left is from the Washington State Department of Ecology. They actually regulate well construction and drillers in the state of Washington. And they have a blog, or they did when I took this um, image from them, and um, there was just a piece of plywood over this. It's in a little well house. You can see all the insulation up against the sides and a funnel sitting there, an old broom. Um, so even when that piece of card or plywood was whole, um, there was that opening with a concrete block on it. Um, not the safest thing. Uh, well, a woman fell in and killed her. Um, and we see this happen a lot more than you realize. But just think what might fall down in that well if somebody's trying to move that plywood, even to look at the pump, uh, which is sitting there. You know, who knows what's floating in there? Mice, snakes. Uh, I doubt that well house is airtight. So anyway, uh, you shouldn't have wells like this. Um, in this case, you should finish the well 10 feet below grade, put a cap on it, and run a six inch pipe up to the surface. And I think I'm gonna show a slide in the questions at the end that shows an example of that. I'll try to remember to touch on it briefly. Um, but these wells just aren't safe uh, or, or healthy. Um, so you should bring it up to code, and, that, and that's different by state. But, um, and I know um, there's no well construction code in Pennsylvania or Alaska yet. Um, and so use the different states or some of the counties in Pennsylvania pass their own ordinances because the state won't. Um, and so if you're in those areas, look at it, what they've done, just uh, require a safe well construction or you know, a rehabilitation. And there's a lot of folks you can talk to, um, your well authority in the area, your county, a contractor or a driller, or extension, and uh, they can help you uh, determine what's the best approach for your situation. The same way with abandoned wells. So um, most people don't abandon old wells in their property. It's just uh, it's an expense, and they can keep it covered, and it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. And so what we've learned is that there are more uh, because well logs weren't required in most states until at least the 60s, and a few even 2000. Uh, there are a lot more undocumented wells in a state than there are wells that are in our files. Like in Illinois, we have about 450,000 well logs. Um, some of those are already sealed, so maybe there's 350,000 or so that are actual active wells, and we know there's at least twice that many um, out there, um, somewhere between uh, 650 and 800,000 wells in Illinois that are in use. And so we don't have logs for most of those. So like wells and pits, there are these abandoned wells that aren't being used are a source of contamination and also they're a safety hazard. And so if you have one, you should properly abandon it. And, in, and I use the wording poorly here. I went to, instead of saying abandoned wells, they're unused wells that need to be properly abandoned so that no one can get hurt and they won't contaminate an aquifer. And so if someone falls into one of those on your property, whether they have a right to be on your property or not, you're more than likely going to get sued or you may be responsible for their death. And so, um, or a well gets contaminated um, or an aquifer gets contaminated because your open well allowed someone to pour stuff down that contaminated somebody else's well, uh, then you could be liable for that. Um, and I'm going to show an example of that too in the questions because someone asked about Iowa's abandoned well code. So uh, these are just some other pictures. There's a horse in a well. These, the two pictures are both from, uh, again, Washington State Department of Ecology in their blog. Uh, the bottom one there, um, this was from 2013, so it's dated, but the guy fell 45 feet and walked away. Um, and I don't know if you saw, it wasn't too long ago, I should have put that picture in here. Uh, very recently, a man, um, I believe in Connecticut, bought a really old home 
and had somebody helping him move in. He fell through the floor into an old well that they built a an addition right over top of without ceiling. And uh, that was maybe three or four weeks ago. Um, and the guy, fortunately, just was scraped up and uh, was okay. And these newspaper clippings are all from the 90s. Three of these are in Illinois, but you know, back before uh, internet was really that active, um, especially people got all their information from newspapers. But as someone who lived near Springfield, I didn't subscribe to the paper up by Buffalo Grove or over by Galesburg. And so I probably would have never heard of these things unless it made it on the radio. And so um, the third one there is the Jessica McClure. Uh, that was covered on national news. If you're old enough to remember, it was highlighted on CNN, I think live for most of it for, you know, it was like a 18 or 22 hour ordeal trying to get this little girl out of a well in Texas. Um, she's grown and has her own kids now, um, but it's, it happens. And uh, it's why you should seal your wells if you have old wells on your property you're not using. So quickly, um, I wanna talk a little bit about our class. As I said before, it's 10 lessons, and then we'll get to the questions. It's 10 lessons um, that's sent via email, so and it's self-paced, so you're really on your own. We're not asking you to do anything um, and anything unusual. You don't have to go get through one online to get to the next. You sign up with your email address. It sends you a PDF once a week for 10 weeks, but you should go through it all. It's a lot of material. Um, and it teaches you about your well and likely questions you might have. And it makes this webinar even more productive for you because you're gonna understand some of the things I'm saying and maybe get more details about others. And so, um, and it gives you a chance to ask better questions because we do get some questions that are just clear that uh, a well owner doesn't know anything about their well. And that's unfortunate because if you're gonna have a well and be responsible for the health of your family, you really need to do your due diligence and do that. And so on our website, privatewellclass.org, um, you can find how to sign up there for that. And I'll walk through that. Um, this is the front page. If you know how your well works, you click on take our free class or learn by email, and it takes you to the page to sign up. We also have podcasts available and videos. Um, I'll talk about that more. There's 10 lessons that I mentioned. For each of the 10 lessons, we also provide a list of publicly available documents that you can use as resources to help you through that material. If something we put in our uh, eight to 10 pages of uh, chapter one, for instance, doesn't make sense to you or you want someone else's perspective, these are the resources we used and uh, resources that have similar information. Um, just like the Raymond Lyle documents that are mentioned up here, the third and fourth bullet under the science of groundwater, those are excellent. They were done in the uh, late 80s, early 90s at Cornell, but they're, they're, he did a great job of explaining well issues. I use several of his figures in our class lessons uh, just because they really help you understand it. And that's what we're after, right? Uh, so for each of the lessons under the resource library tab, you can get to these and uh, you can put as much time in as you want um, to learn more about those things. And uh, if I've included a state, it's because they have it like the Iowa Groundwater Basics, the next to last bullet under lesson one, um, or the Michigan Flowing Well Handbook, which is the first bullet under number two. It is a great resource about flowing wells for anyone. Um, Michigan just has a lot of flowing wells, and so they passed a law requiring those to be capped. They were losing 28 million gallons of water a day uh, to flowing uncapped wells, but that handbook has a lot of good information in it uh, for anyone that might have a flowing well, which is you know, a unique thing. Um, our artesian flowing well, um, only occurs in certain areas. We have a couple of places in Illinois that do too. We also record every webinar we do. Uh, last month was our annual septic webinar. We brought on an expert uh, from Massachusetts who used to be a sanitarian there um, and is now with RCAP to answer your questions. So that webinar covers material related to septic systems, about Septic Smart, which is an EPA program that everyone should know about if you have a septic system. And then we answered a lot of questions from uh, the folks that attended. Every webinar we've ever done, it says right there uh, on the right, webinar recording 70. Every one of our webinars is recorded. And at the end, the questions we're gonna get to, uh, in many cases are different. Some things are the same. How do I disinfect a well? We get asked 10 or 20 times every month. So we put it in there every month. Um, but some things are very different. And you'll learn a lot about different issues, all that stuff by going through all those questions in those past webinars. Um, 
we also do specialty webinars. Like the last time we did this one on lead was in 20, uh, 2018, but uh, it's a really good resource. We brought an expert from Virginia Tech on to help discuss this. Um, she's done a lot of work with uh, private wells and lead and really, um, you know, the lead issues in Flint are much different than you would have in your private well. And uh, you can't do a lot about without treatment, your water quality uh, and your corrosion potential of your water. And this teaches you about those things and what to know about lead solder, um, why you need to, to sample and understand the pH and alkalinity and uh, some of the other inorganic values of your well and that sort of stuff. And also what we what they've learned about lead in that in some cases, like in states like Virginia, they allow galvanized pipe, um, which also has lead. And so they see lead from the drop pipe in the well an hour later, even after they've done their five minutes of flushing, um, just because of either particulate lead or some of those things. So there's a lot of good information there. If you're interested in that, you should really take a look. Um, for things like lead, we also created uh, a source page and it's just privatewellclass.org slash lead. It gives you uh, links to a lot of the uh, sites that you would be interested in or should be from CDC and US EPA and um, basics on all that stuff. And you know, water filters that reduce lead. There's some really good filters out there for lead reduction um, that were tested by EPA as well as the certified products. Uh, then there's a series of these training videos, which is shows 16 there. There's I think there's 18 now, um, and this about different topics that become an issue uh, we get asked about. Shared wells is a really big deal, which I didn't realize because we don't hear a lot about it in Illinois. But if you're sharing a well with another home, just remember if that well's not on your property and you don't have anything in your deed or have any kind of contract for your little association that may all be sharing a well, someone else buys that property that owns the well. They may decide they don't want to share anymore or without any kind of shared agreement when the pump fails and there's a three thousand dollar expense there you may all of a sudden have neighbors that have been your friends for 10 years all of a sudden you find out you're not friends anymore um, and so it's better to have all that worked out uh, legally and have something in place that gives you a, a responsibility as well as a right to that water and so um, you know there's a lot of information available some states uh, well, one state in particular, Washington state, uh, actually re regulates uh, down to two homes on a well. It's a special type of public water supply. And that way they can have some say and make sure that some of those things are in place. They have reduced sampling re compared to uh, what a community water supply would do, but they still um, need to sample and they help, you know, because one person shouldn't be responsible for another person's health. Or if they are, then someone needs to make sure they're doing. Uh, right by those folks. And that's the point. Common sense things like why does my well keep losing pressure? So we have this one and also how does my pressure tank work? And there's some of the most popular videos we have. I think how does my pressure tank work has had over 300,000 views in three years or maybe more than that by now. Um, and what it's taught us is there's not a lot of good information out there about some of these common problems and also a lot of people have pressure problems that are on private wells, which makes sense. We did too. Um, and so um, there's just good basic information there to get you started. I mentioned we have a podcast. We've done the first three lessons. That's one, two, and three on this list, as well as um, RFD Illinois Radio, which is the Farm Bureau Radio, um, has had us on several times to do uh, question and answer about uh, different topics. And so um, they've given us that audio recording and we made a podcast out of it. We hope to do the other seven. Uh, they're a little more detailed because of the issues included. In some, for some things, it's impossible to really give people all the details they need without an image. And uh, so we're running into a problem with that, or I am. And maybe it's just because I'm old school. But anyway, there's a lot of good information. And these podcasts are popular. I think there's been close to 3,000 downloads, um, which... You know, I'm not a podcast listener, uh, so it's awesome to see that that's uh, reaching folks as well. The entire class is available in Spanish. If you're a provider or, a, you know, someone, a professional that works with well owners in some capacity, whether it's driller, contractor, realtor, uh, sanitarian, uh, health, environment health professional, um, if you have folks in your area that are native Spanish speakers um, or extension, 
um, you know, direct them to this class. The entire thing has been translated into Spanish, including some of the videos, and uh, you know, it's there to provide uh, that service. So in the end, the goal of our program and what we strive to do is, is help well owners understand their well. They need to know why it's important and why they need to know how it works, whether they have a bedrock well or a old hand and dug well, um, how deep their pump set, what kind of geology in, where they're at on the landscape, all those things that you need to understand to understand your risk. And that's really the goal. Um, because many wells are perfectly safe um, and many wells aren't. And uh, not knowing uh, is just, there's no reason for it. You just need to educate yourself. I started to say earlier, I didn't finish. Um, the two biggest problems we see, or maybe I did, are poor construction and lack of well owner uh, education and knowledge. And that's not a, not a knock on well owners. Um, well owners come from every demographic. That's why they're so challenging. They're rich, they're poor, uh, they're rural, they're urban, um, they're educated, they're non-educated, um, everything. You find well owners in every demographic. And so um, some have been uh, on a same farm for over 100 years, their family. Some are, you know, decided to move out to the country and they've always lived in, you know, on a community water supply. But a lot of them just don't understand uh, their wells and they haven't gone to the trouble to do that. Um, we had a professor who moved here from New York City and bought a little um, house out in the country, contacted us about what to do about their well because he had no idea. He bought this house, had a well, he didn't think a lot of it. Uh, the fact that it had a well and now they had a problem and he had no idea what to do about it. And this is a PhD uh, professor. So um, it is, it affects everyone. It's just understanding the relative importance to your health and your family um, is what we're trying to get across. So um, I'm gonna go to the questions that y'all asked. We had over a hundred questions today because we had I think 424 or so people sign up and uh, we'll get to a, a number of those we've answered here in the slides. And uh, you know, obviously we can't answer them all. Plus some of them we've answered um, a number of times in the past or a number of people ask the same question. And so, especially when that occurs, I try to always use those questions because if I know there's three or four people on this webinar that have the same question, um, we'll provide that answer today. Um, I do wanna remind you that um, on your GoToWebinar uh, box or menu, there is a question or a chat box. Katie is monitoring that and has been the whole time. So if uh, there's something you wanna ask that um, doesn't come up or it's about what I've said today, um, we'll answer those. Um, we have a neat system. We use a shared Google document. Katie's typing it all in. Uh, when the time comes, I'll end the slideshow and pull that Google doc up on the screen and we'll just go through them. Uh, and if I can't answer them, I will. If I can't, I will ask you to send me an email and I will find you an answer and email it back to you. So, um, and again, one last time, um, all of our past webinars have questions like the ones we're about to go through. Not the same questions, but questions that are asked from participants. So it's really worth your time to go back to all of our older videos. Skip ahead if you want to. Like this particular webinar you saw earlier was given, has been given about five times in the last two years. If you go through all five of those and just skip to the questions part, this particular slide, all the questions below that I will have answered because people asked on that particular webinar. Many are different, some are really off the wall um, where we really thought it was worth answering, we did. And uh, you'll learn a lot more about well issues by doing so. Uh, so the first one, are deeper wells necessarily less susceptible to bacterial contamination? Well, so as I said earlier, bacterial contamination occurs because of a shallow source. You know, if it's, it can be actual groundwater getting to your well, if it's a shallow well, like through a septic system or infiltration to a shallow aquifer. Um, but if it's surface related, if it's surface infiltration near your well or runoff around your well, then either your well's not grouted properly. And so it's running down the outside of the well until it gets to where it can get in your well or you have a breach in your casing and your cap's not sealed properly, then any of those things can cause bacterial contamination of any well, no matter how deep it is. But we do see most bacterial problems occur in shallower wells, where they're taken from a shallow source, or they're older shallow wells, where they're not, the wellhead's not properly sealed. Um, but again, if your wellhead is, uh, there's damage, you have a crack casing, 
uh, that sort of thing, it really doesn't matter how deep your well is. It can get into the well at the surface, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Your well needs to you know, be properly sealed and avoid that to happen. And so again, deeper wells are less, shy, less risky, but um, the last point there is it also matters uh, about the type of well you have. So I bring that up because of bedrock wells. And the best example I have is I went to New York a few years ago to work in uh, upstate New York with some folks about their well issues. Uh, their bedrock's basically at the surface. So um, their aquifer is at the surface and all the cracks and fissures in the rock can promote water getting down into the aquifer. So there, there are some wells that were literally three to 600 feet deep, but the casing, only goes down a little ways. And that's because a bedrock well only gets its water from the fractures in the rock, not the rock itself. And so you're counting on those fractures to be a conduit into your well. And so you only put casing down as far as you need to. And then the rest of it's an open hole because when you drill through bedrock, the hole stays open. If you're drilling a hole through a rock, it's not gonna go anywhere. It's not gonna cave in. And so we saw cases where there was only less than 20 feet of casing for a 300 to 600 foot well. So if that's the case, uh, if you're one of the, if that was your well, then you're definitely at risk of bacterial contamination because uh, anything from the surface, some of those cracks and fissures in the rock go up to the surface and they, there's a direct conduit into the groundwater there. And so we see a lot of contamination in areas like that from surface uh, uh, issues like uh, septic or livestock, and uh, so it really matters to, um, you have to know that information as well. Um, yeah. Uh, deeper wells are better. So this slide is actually from a previous one, but it was, uh, they were asked uh, along with the other question I just answered. And so I wanted to include it. Basically, um, deeper isn't necessarily better. It typically, the further away you are from the surface, the better for surface infiltration getting, uh, causing a problem. But other things aren't. Right, I would just mentioned properly constructed and grouted. You know, water can also run down the outside of a casing if the grout's not there. So when you drill a well, the grout fills the annulus, which when you drill a hole for a well, let's say you're gonna put in a five inch well, you might drill a six and a half inch hole and or a seven and three quarters inch hole. And then you put the five inch well inside it. Well, the area between those two is just open. So you put clay grout or cement grout. Most states have a requirement for the type of grout so that that uh, can't be a pathway down to your, uh, where your water's coming in your well. Um, that doesn't always stay in place. Um, wells aren't necessarily properly constructed all the time. And so it could be that you have a breach that way. And if that's the case, uh, you know, that needs to be mitigated. Um, the other thing about deep wells is when you're in deep, especially in bedrock, not necessarily, um, but they tend to have more metals. We see arsenic in both sand and gravel and bedrock aquifers. Radium is usually a bedrock problem or uranium. Um, so you could be in an area where there's naturally occurring contaminants and having a deep well may get you into one of those units where you have a higher issue. Um, but it may be that you have to go deeper. Like in Massachusetts, the reason they have that guide up for well owners is because to get to water, you're gonna be in a deeper aquifer or a bedrock aquifer and it's just, it's it's there, it's in the source material. Arsenic's the seventh most common element in the Earth's crust. So there's really no way around uh, finding it in some places. So again, ask your health department, your state primacy agency, which the state primacy agency is the agency that has primacy over community water supplies. So they many of them have a groundwater group that looks at source water protection and naturally occurring contaminant issues or your state agency that evaluates groundwater quality. Like in Illinois, both our state geologic and water survey do that, DNR in other states, um, Department of Environmental Quality, Department of Environmental Services, they all go by different names. But if you look up um, aquifer mapping in your, in your state name, the agencies that do that are gonna show up also, as well as well with USGS, if there's a USGS office in your state that has uh, done a lot of those things. They'll all help you if you contact them. That, that's the message. And if you run into a problem ever with a state or federal agency not helping you, contact me. I'll call them because uh, that I mean, maybe it's happened once, but most of the time they not understand that you know that's their job and they're here to help you. A lot of them really enjoy 
those sorts of efforts because it's really a chance to educate the public. And so um, you should do those things. Uh, is chlorinating a necessary maintenance uh, or only when noting a bacteria presence? So generally you don't chlorinate unless you need to. Um, it's, and it's only necessary. And what we tell well owners is you chlorinate is usually shock chlorination um, and that's only because you've tested and found bacteria. Um, but people use springs or ponds or have very shallow groundwater sources, like you know their water table may only be five to 10 feet below land surface uh, and their well is only 20 feet deep. Then you could have a continuous bacteria problem that would require you to use continuous disinfection. And I use disinfection in capitals here because it doesn't mean you have to use chlorination. Um, it could also mean UV. Um, and I'll show some other options, I believe. But uh, now I think that you know there's some effort to use uh, hydrogen peroxide as a disinfectant. Anything that oxidizes and disinfects um, could be used. UV kills bacteria, ultraviolet light. Uh, there are a lot of options now for home treatment using UV. But again, it requires maintenance and it's a upfront purchase. But if you detect bacteria, that's when you use shock chlorination. It's a one-time dose of chlorine that you run throughout your system. Uh, to kill any bacteria that are in your well or in your pipes, your plumbing system. And in some cases that doesn't work. We tell people to do it more than once. You could have a bacteria buildup in your well, uh, like for iron bacteria that causes that sulfur smell, um, that may take more than one time to kill it. But if you disinfected two or three times and you're still having a problem, then you likely have a source, like you know the spring or pond example or shallow groundwater example. It could be your septic or livestock um, or whatever. But um, you're likely going to need continuous disinfection in order to keep your water from having bacteria in it. Um, and that's just unfortunate, but it happens. Um, another question we got was, why does chlorine decrease over time? I'm using 12.5% sodium hypochlorite at a 1 ppm dose. So this is someone I'm taking uh, that has, and I said this at the end, I assume this is a continuous feed of 1 ppm chlorine. So if you have a continuous chlorinator and you're feeding chlorine, um, it's going to reduce. The idea is that it kills the bacteria that's in your system, and it also oxidizes things. So it gets used up. That's why it's a disinfectant. That's why it's reacting with things. Um, what communities have to do that have a distribution system, so they have to make sure that there's chlorine, still residual chlorine in the line at the very end of their distribution system, which means the last house on the farthest line. And uh, states vary. And which is why I included this little graph down here. States have um, have the uh, what's the right word uh, the leeway to determine what kind of residual they want to require. So if you can read that, and this is from a Journal of American Waterworks Association article that EPA had on a slide deck on their website. Um, these are state requirements for free chlorine residual in in distribution systems. So you know Louisiana requires 0.5. And I imagine that's a pretty recent rule because of uh, the negliophalii uh, problem they have had uh, over the years. But most require at least detectable chlorine at the end. And so 0.5 isn't bad. Um, I think on the high end, uh, states are limited. You can't have more than 4 ppm, which seems pretty high. Um, but it's, it's to make sure there's no bacteria. So it's OK that it's reduced. It's great that you still have 0.2. Uh, is the bottom line. If it's not detectable, then you need to increase your dose. That's uh, what I tell anyone with a continuous chlorinator. So, um, and it's good that you know this information. I was uh, happy with this question, uh, partly because it means you're in the game, uh, so to speak, and that's a good thing. So as long as you're seeing residual, it should all be good. Uh, and that's the, that's the answer to your question. Um, do I need to cover a uh, cover over the well? Um, we do not have a shed or anything over it as it sits in the middle of our front yard. Well, many wells today are just put in a yard. They're not covered by anything other than they have a well cap with a proper seal. As long as your well's properly constructed so that that grout is in the annulus, so that nothing can go down along your well. Um, you know, there's best practices, which you'd be better off going through our class because uh, there's a whole section on that. But, you know, the, the ground should be sloping away from your well, so runoff runs away and doesn't pond at your well. Um, there's a lot of little tidbits like that, 
but what's most important is it's properly constructed and it has a proper well cap that's sealed, then you don't necessarily need a well house. You know, our old dug well had a well house. That's because it also was on a concrete pad uh, with a three foot circle opening that we kept a piece of wood over. My dad did when I was a kid. Um, you know, in the winter he had a propane tank down there so the pipes didn't freeze. Uh, which that warmth attracted animals. Uh, it's, you know, um, you need to, it, it, if you're going to have a, a well that things can get in, like I think I showed, um, I probably didn't show in this presentation, but if one of the presentation we did in May on groundwater and well construction shows a lot of examples of poor wells, and all those should be uh, somehow properly sealed at the surface if it's possible. And uh, again, I think I have a slide where I can at least show you a quick example of the way wells are constructed today that are large diameter that might help. Oh, it's right here. So these are three types of wells. The one on the left is a bedrock well. And I wanted to show this quickly just because well construction really matters. So in a bedrock well, you see the casing. If you follow it down, it only goes down 10 to 20 feet of casing into bedrock. And then it's seated there and the rest of it's open hole. And again, it's to take advantage of those bedrock fractures so they actually can, uh, the, the hole you've drilled intersects the bedrock fractures where the water can come from, okay? So the New York example I used, that whole casing might have been less than 20 feet down. And that's a real risk because things can infiltrate from to 20 feet in most cases. So that's the risk of a bedrock well. So a 200 foot bedrock well, is much different than a 200 foot sand and gravel well, which is a screen that's in the upper right. And a sand and gravel well, you have a screen at the bottom that's sized, those slots are sized such that the sand can't come through, but the water can. The rest, there's maybe um, for a 200 foot sand and gravel well, you may have a four or five foot section of screen at the bottom, and the rest of it is solid casing. So the only place water can come in the well in a sand and gravel well is through the screen. That four foot or five foot section of screen that's from 195 to 200. In a 200 foot bedrock well, if you only have 20 feet of casing, water can come in anywhere from 20 feet to 200 feet below land surface. That's risky, or could be, if there's bedrock fractures like these show that run back towards the surface, or if it's a karst environment where there's likely sinkholes and caves um, you're going to have contamination. Pike County, Illinois, which is all karst, 80% of their private well samples come back positive for coliform and close to that in E. coli. So they, uh, in the last 40 years or so, have spent a lot of uh, time and effort to building a regional water district so that even people out in rural areas in the country that had private wells are now in a public water system. So they extend pipe miles for three or four homes. And um, yeah, we were involved a little bit with that. And it's, it ensures that the water quality is there because there's no way to get safe water. And it would require homeowners to all have a pretty expensive treatment in order to make sure their water's safe. And so it, um, it made sense. And talking about uh, standing, or large diameter wells, the bottom picture on the right are two examples of properly constructed large diameter wells in Illinois. This is from Illinois Extension. And the one on the right, where it shows the concrete pad down at 10 feet and then a six inch uh, pipe coming up to the surface. And it says four inch there, but most of the time you're using six. Um, it looks like a drilled well. That's a you know, small diameter well, but in fact, it's a large diameter well because there's no good aquifer there and they're taking advantage of the sand lenses that are these shallow depths. But by putting clean earth fill is what it says here, or concrete or grout or clay in the upper 10 feet, you're providing more protection uh, for the well from surface contamination. And this is something you could do with your current large diameter well, especially old hand dug well, is you could uh, dig down 10 feet, put in a cap and then seal over it with concrete and run a straight uh, uh, six inch pipe up to the surface and have it uh, put in like a drilled well would be with a, you know, there's a, this shows by the way, where it says two pressure tank, that is a pitless adapter that runs out of the side of the casing and that could all be pulled up. Your pump can be pulled up through that six inch casing and that's the way that's installed. And that's what I would do um, or just put in a new well. 
that's this way. And it, you know, it may be a wash because some of those old wells, especially if they're hand brick lined or stone lined, which are still in use, you know, like the one I grew up on, um, it's probably not worth trying to salvage anything from that. Um, and like in our case, my grandpa put in our dug well at the bottom of a ravine, um, basically because he knew that's where all the water would run. So it's also getting surface runoff. Uh, and it's just, it's the worst possible way, which you know may explain a lot to some people. Um, I wanted to mention this, those three figures are in this webinar. We did it in May. And if you go to uh, webinars and events, there's a drop down if you scroll over it, it'll say past webinars. It'll take you to a page where they're listed. You just scroll down and you'll get to this one. It was just in May, it wasn't that long ago. And that webinar explains more about well construction and a lot of the details that we don't have time to provide today. Um, how would someone go about dealing with an issue regarding the landlord of a rental property not authorizing water well testing? Um, it really depends on where you're at. There are no rules necessarily for private wells, but um, I would advise you to contact, uh, well, first of all, whether you're a renter or a buyer, I would, uh, you need to look at it like buyer beware. Don't rent the house if you haven't tested the water. And if they refuse to let you test the water, don't rent from them. But if it were past that point, um, then you're only, especially if you go to your landlord and they say, we don't want to do this, we don't want you to, contact your local health department. Find out if there are any rules in place. In some places, it's actually a law now. Some local jurisdictions, some uh, local health districts have made it a law that if you're a landlord, you have to test the water and make sure it's potable for a rental. Um, so you may even have that on your side, but either way, ask them what you should do or if they can help. And I put on here personal situation, my son. My son decided to rent a house out in the country. We went out to look at it, got an old hand dug well with a uh, concrete pad that split in two, had an old hand pump that was off to the side, open hole. Um, and so I said, you need to get that tested. Um, I gave him three or four months, he never got it done. So I went and got a kit, um, sampled it, and uh, it had coliform bacteria in it. So I took that back to him and said, we need to talk to your landlord. He didn't want me to talk to his landlord, fine. But um, I wanted him to do something about it. So on my own, I contacted our health department, which has no real rules that I know of uh, in Illinois to uh, interfere there. But they said it was a public health risk. And then under that, they could do something about it if I needed him to. And uh, luckily his landlord decided to take care of it after uh, he went to him with the sample results and I didn't have to pull that card, but um, just ask, because it is a public health risk. If you don't know and there's concern and it's a well that might not be properly uh, done, your landlord has a responsibility to make sure you're safe and to provide potable water. In some states, not providing potable water is a reason to condemn a home. Um, I believe in Rhode Island. And they have that tied through their building inspector program. So uh, do something about it, uh, yeah. My well was recently fracked and I still occasionally get gray cloudy water in the house. Is it safe to drink? How can I eliminate the issue? First of all, I wanna make it clear that fracking a water well to increase capacity is a lot different than the fracking we read about in the news for oil. Um, and that's very fortunate. It's, it, they shouldn't be using any kind of chemicals uh, that are harmful. Um, they should be, uh, once they've done that work, it's really meant to just increase the size of fractures in bedrock. Um, it should allow more water to actually get in your well, which is the only reason you would frack a water well. Um, but when any time a well is drilled or being modified, like by fracking, like yours was, then drilling mud or fines um, or other geologic material may get in there because in some cases you're pushing water in uh, to try to uh, super pressurize the system and crack it, uh, things like that. And so in the end, then they pump it. It's called developing the well to get all that stuff out. So especially with the new well, you could pump a well for two days at a high rate. Let's say you have a well that you're going to put a 10 gallon per minute pump in, in the end for a home. They may pump it at 40, 50, or 100 gallons a minute uh, for five hours, 10 hours, two days. It just depends on the driller and what they, how clean the water gets um, until all that's gone. Um, sometimes some of that can linger in there or be somehow caught in uh, a unit that, you know, for whatever reason, because of lowered water levels or whatever, um, it didn't come out when it should have. And it should really be a short-term thing and not be a safety issue. 
Um, if it keeps happening and you still have a concern, then uh, as soon as you find cloudy water, stop pumping any water, go get a sample kit and have your water tested to be sure, but I don't, I don't think it would be a problem. Okay, um, that didn't go anywhere. There we go. Uh, quickly, things to do, consider about bacteria. There's a lot of issues that can affect the well and why you have bacteria in your well. Uh, well construction, geology, your water source. Um, we're gonna talk about shock chlorinating a well in a minute. And uh, when you disinfect your well, uh, you should use the approach that we're recommending um, because it's really the best one out there right now. There are some issues uh, with any approach depending on the water quality in your well and uh, your personal situation, but in general, this works for almost everyone. And then you need to re retest, as I mentioned before, until you know it's safe. And uh, then test annually and don't, re don't chlorinate again until you uh, test and have bacteria. And one of the reasons for that is because Chlorine is an oxidant and it can affect like the, um, your, it can affect, it can cause leaching for one. It's, a, uh, it's an oxidant. So it can affect the brass in your pump, uh, the rubber seals in your pitless. Um, and so especially if you're not using the right procedure and you have it at too strong of a concentration, um, it can leach metals um, that then will you know, be in your water system until you pump it out. Um, a couple of things to note, chlorine is ineffective above the pH of eight. I only learned this a few years ago. And so if you're in a high pH environment, um, it's possible that pH isn't effective. It could be one of the reasons why you shot chlorinated several times and it hasn't done anything. It takes a lot more chlorine at a pH of eight uh, to do the same amount of disinfection than it does at the pH of seven. And so it's something to look into if you have those issues. Um, or if it's a local source, I mentioned before, if it's a really shallow well, you have livestock or septic or it's karst, it's gonna keep coming back. You're gonna to need to go to continuous uh, disinfection and uh, which I've mentioned here. And the other options are just to put in a different well or repair a well if it's not up to code, try to find a different aquifer, which means deeper. You know, we have places in Illinois where you could drill, if you want to drill deep enough, you can hit five or six different aquifers and you can separate them all. They have different water chemistry, they're different sources, some are bedrock, some are sand and gravel. And so, um, Matter of fact, I think in, it's in Wisconsin, there's a bedrock unit that's so high in arsenic that the state legislature has banned any wells to be drilled in that unit, but there's better water below it and above it. So you can actually put a well in below it as long as you case that unit off, um, but you have to case it off so there's no chance of water from that unit affecting your well water uh, because of the arsenic concentration in the thousands, I believe. Uh, so well disinfection. Um, and this is a previous question, but we got to ask a bunch of questions about well disinfection. We always do. So I'm just going to mention that on our website under uh, resources, there's a tab for each of the 10 lessons. I showed you one and two. Lesson 10 is called water treatment solutions. And in that, that list of resources is a, this guide from the Minnesota Department of Health. We looked at probably 70 different ones that are out there. Everybody a lot of counties and everybody else have a guide on well disinfection. Some are a pamphlet, some are half a page, some are 20 pages. Uh, this one has all the right information in it, and it really goes through the details and thinks about your safety and why you should turn off the power and a lot of things, and so it's the one we recommend. Um, yeah, so the first thing you should do is boil your water if you're going to drink it, if you have a problem. Uh, this is just one of the pages in there. It teaches you how to mix it to the right concentration so you're not pouring straight bleach in your well, which can damage some of the components, as I mentioned. It also has information even if you have softeners or other treatment, um, but it walks you through step by step how to find that stuff. So um, I skipped over that quickly because I already passed 2.30, but um, it's on our website if you want to look at it. So Nearby septic and crops, I combine two questions here because I really I started writing the same answer for both. My neighbor across the street is installing a new septic system and the drain field is directly uphill from my well, right across the street, maybe 100 feet. Should I be concerned? And what are the risks of, for a well surrounded by crops? Well, both of those, the specifics of your well really matter. If you have an older, shallower well, then I, it could be quite a concern, uh, especially over time as that septic field starts um, moving, you know, it, it has to move through the ground at a rate that could take several years for any of that to reach if it goes your direction. But typically, shallow groundwater follows the water table. 
and the water table follows the land surface uh, contours. And so a water table is where the ground is 100% saturated. It could be in a clay, so it's not an aquifer. You can't put a well in it, but water still moves through it slowly. And over time, it will get wherever it's going to go uh, based on pressure head because water flows downhill. So if you're downhill of a septic system, there's potential for that to be a problem. The same way with crops, um, what's being put on the surface is going to infiltrate in some of it. It's not being used by the crops. And so it really depends on the type of well you have, the type of soil you have. If you're in a sandy soil with a shallow sandy aquifer, then it's more of a risk than if you have a deeper well. You know, we have bedrock, we have sand and gravel aquifers here that are buried under 100 feet of clay before you get to the sand. And if that's grouted properly and you have a solid casing for that 100 feet, then you would not have any surface problems likely in that well. Actually, the example I used of the well where we had the three chemistry samples uh, for outside with a filter and uh, after RO, that was a 240 foot well uh, that gets its water from the bottom five feet from 235 to 240 and it's solid pipe all the way down and there's nearly 100 feet of clay at the surface. So there's no risk of surface contamination there unless it's a well construction problem. The other consideration is the geology, as I mentioned, whether it's sand, clay, or rock. If the rock's at the surface, there's going to be cracks in the rock. That's a direct conduit for water to get in and contaminants to get in. And so all those things are considerations. Uh, so it really depends. Uh, your risk is associated with those things. Um, old unused wells. I used it right, the right term this time. Uh, are old well, do old wells need to be reconstructed or plugged according to Iowa State Code? So yes, like many states, there are laws about sealing and properly abandoning old unused wells. I Googled just to answer this question, Iowa abandoned well, and the first link was to DNR's well plugging page. And I only showed a portion of it here, but further down, it lists you have three choices if you have one of these wells. Um, you've mentioned two of them. You can fix it, so it's usable. You can plug it according to Iowa State code, which they have a well abandonment code. Uh, that you have to follow because they want to make sure you're not just throwing trash in there to fill it up, that you're using clay or bentonite or concrete for at least part of that so that water can't get from the surface uh, inside the well down to an aquifer. The other is you can put it on standby, and I um, many states don't have that option. I didn't read the details. Uh, you can, but um, you should do the same for your state if you have an old well and are thinking about an abandonment. And the other thing I'll mention is in February, we did a webinar on financing for wells and septic and all those things. There aren't very many options for wells um, or for septic, but it turns out there's a lot of choices locally. Um, if your soil water conservation district or your watershed group, some of them have programs with a cost share, dealing abandoned wells and pay up to maybe four or $500 of the, which is half the cost uh, to get it plugged properly using a, using a licensed well a contractor. And that's what we recommend you do. Um, and some states, the counties of the local health department may also have requirements that you have to notify them and your driller can do that. Um, yeah, the important thing is to get it sealed uh, so that, and sealed with uh, material that won't let water through like concrete or and or clay, bentonite clay. Um, but there's, a, there's options there and I encourage you to look at uh, that February webinar if you're interested in maybe possibly having an option because uh, I think in Iowa, there's a grants to counties program for every county health department, and they may be able to use some of those funds to cost share, uh, which is the only state I know that has a program like that. You know, kudos to Iowa, uh, the state legislature for, for providing those dollars. Oh, look what I did. Um, I left it in. Extra slide. Uh, new well owners, city kid purchasing a farm and looking for as much dollars as I can get. So we get this question a lot too. Um, honestly, the first thing to do is take our class. It has a lot more detail. You're going to learn a lot more than you are today. Um, it really walks you through all the information you need to know, why your well type matters, um, who you can contact, how to find local information, what your treatment options are. Uh, just It starts off from the basics. It's a lesson. Um, I wrote it on groundwater and wells, how wells work, types of wells, how water moves through the ground, how it gets in your well, why Land slope doesn't always matter with the direction of groundwater flow. Um, what happens when you pump a well, all that stuff is covered and it's really worth your time. 
and that'll help you a lot uh, get started and then find local sources you can rely on uh, that you could call and ask a question whether that's your extension your health department um, you know some kind of protection group uh, county health local health or, or state agency like a geolog geological survey or water survey dnr um, all those folks uh, can be a resource for you and you should get to know who they are um, we also had a bunch of questions that are answered in our 10 lesson class that are uh, pretty common questions that would take a little bit like a maintenance schedule or how to find uh, what are the best practices for annual maintenance of my well that sort of thing so rather than try to answer all those here i just want to let you know that they're in the class lessons and so um, you sign up with your email address and what state you live in and your first name and that's all we ask and that's really so that we can show us epa and rcap that we're reaching people in all 50 states so um, it's self-paced it's completely free and again as i said in the last sentence here you have to read it that's the only catch and uh, you know we were told uh, at one point that you know, our class is, has too much information it's, it's it's 86 pages when you do all 10 lessons but if you read it every week it's only eight right so uh, that you need something that's much more condensed well if you start condensing things down to a level that doesn't really cover all the basics well owners need to know then in the end you really don't know very much and so um, we're trying to reach well owners that want to do something about learning about their well that want to be able to take care of their well properly and want to protect their family. And so um, it's probably not long enough uh, when you look at it that way, but it's certainly worth your time. Uh, so you go back to our web page, you click on take our free class or click on learn by email to take you to the page where you can sign up. Um, I think this might be my last slide or next to last slide. My house is connected to a public water system. How do I know my water is safe to drink? And I wanted to address this because um, we see a lot of times where people hook up to a public water system but still have their well. Um, some places that's actually illegal. Some they've allowed it, especially when some of these rural water districts were going in 40 years ago. Now it's hardly ever allowed. But um, make no mistake that your public water supply is your best source of water. Uh, no matter what you might think, public water supplies are regulated. Every state, by this, either by their state agency or in one state, Wyoming, by the US EPA region, but you know, in Illinois, we have an Illinois EPA, Wisconsin has DNR, New York has Department of Health. Every state has an agency, no matter what they might be called, that's their state compliance agency. Their job, they get money from EPA every year to run a program to make sure every public water supply in the state is doing all the testing and meets all the requirements for a Safe Drinking Water Act uh, rules, for the Safe Drinking Water Act rules, including that your arsenic's below 10 and uh, you know, every other, there's no bacteria, that there's chlorine residual in your distribution system, all of those things. So your water is much more likely to be safe and protected by a public water supply, unless you yourself are a licensed water operator and know that much about water, sample for all the regulated contaminants every quarter, like they do, um, and have all that knowledge in place and understand how your pump works and all those other things. So our assessment tool even asks if you're close to a public water supply, and for a reason, um, and that is we run across well owners who I can honestly say have no business being a well owner. They don't understand how it works. They don't care to understand. They know there's water there um, and they have no idea what risks they're taking and they don't want to listen to that and that's their business. But in those cases, it's much better if they were on a public water supply where somebody else was ensuring that their water is safe to drink. If you're on a public water supply, you get a CCR once a year, um, and maybe those rules may have changed, but at least once a year you get a CCR, which stands for Consumer Confidence Report. It lists all their testing results, what they found, if they've been out of compliance with anything, and they're required by law to do this. Um, you can ask them for it at any time. Uh, they come in your bill, which I know most people take that stuff or stuff and just toss it, but you should really, your water is important. You're, you're drinking your water every day. Um, you know, a lot of people spend so much money on bottled water because they're concerned about their public water supply water. Honestly, that's nonsense. So if Flint had a problem every once in a while, a community where someone doesn't do their job has a problem, but virtually every water operator in the country does their job every day and make sure your water's safe. And why you'd want to be on a public water, on a private well, versus a public water supply because you think it's going to save you money 
not if you're doing your due diligence and doing the work. It should cost you about the same. And so um, that's 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 my advice and the way I look at it. Um, the Deb example is a colleague who um, lived in town and was going to buy a house out in the country here near Champaign. Uh, south of town, there's an arsenic problem in the shallow aquifer. They mentioned they were going to buy a house out there, so I suggested they have their well have the well tested for arsenic before they buy it. Um, they did. The arsenic was at 78 ppb, which is uh, 7.8 times the legal limit for a public water supply. Uh, they want to know what their options were. I said, well, you either need to add treatment like RO, um, or I said, you're right on the edge of that subdivision that was built. Um, you know, I don't know how far down the community water supply what lines run. It turned out that new subdivision had water lines from the, our public water supply. It was right across the road. So they contacted Illinois American as a water company for Champaign and, and Savoy. They contacted them and asked them about hooking up to their public water supply. And uh, they found out they could do it. I don't remember how much it was, uh, three to $5,000, I think, to run a line under the road. Um, and now they have a water bill just like I do, um, but they don't have to worry about arsenic in their water. And um, if they didn't do that, they could certainly treat it, but they have to maintain an RO system. They probably should test it for arsenic um, every so often to make sure the system's working like it's supposed to. Um, I don't know if, if they're planning to have kids, uh, they're gonna have babies in the house uh, so at some point. Um, all those things are something you need to think about long-term. So for me, when I bought the house that I plan on living in a long time, uh, it's a no-brainer to spend the three to $5,000, uh, even if I had to borrow it, uh, to ensure that my water's safe. And so uh, public water supplies are reliable. They're quiet. I was on, actually on a call today with five water operators in Illinois, and someone asked them the question, um, how, many public, how many residents of your community have contacted you with questions? And these are not small communities, all over 10,000 customers or 10,000 homes. Not a single one has got a single call from their customer. They take that as uh, their customers trust them. And I'm sure that's true too. Um, but um, it's also that people don't realize how important their water is, um, understand where it's really coming from, um, and some of that in some cases. And so your public water supply is your best bet. Sorry to uh, spend the time there on that, but it's an important issue. Okay, so that's uh, that's our presentation for today, but we do have um, our questions here. I'm gonna pull them up. And Katie, um, you can see that? Yep, I can see it, Steve. Great, thank you. Okay, so the first question is, we are part of a shared well system, it is near a road and unfenced, cattle sometimes graze. Yeah, and this is, um, this. you did ask this question before, I'm sorry I didn't get to it. Um, it, again, it, I, th I thought I fairly would answered it, and um, you should keep them away. I think your question is, should you have a fence? Um, if it's an older well especially, and if you're not sure that if, if runoff can get to the well, then it's better to have it fenced off so they can't get to it. Um, you should add dirt around the well so that uh, and seed it so that there's a slope away from the well in all directions. And... Um, yeah, especially if they're pooping on top. It sounds like it might be a larger well uh, if they can poop on top of it. So um, yeah, it's probably shallow then as well. And uh, not that I know all those facts, but feel free to email us and even send me a picture. Um, but in, you know, it should be protected from anything at the surface. That's the bottom line. Whether that's cattle that can graze, you know, I, in the, I show a. In one of the other presentations, I show a old hand dug well that's got a bunch of pieces of tin over the top of it with concrete blocks. And there's three posts that look like they're worn down to nothing. And that's because they're in a pasture with cattle. And the cattle come up there and rub on those posts. And they're obviously doing the same thing. And it's just, uh, and it's a real shallow well. And so it's certainly affected by uh, those cattle. And uh, that's the idea is just to keep it, uh, anything away from it that might cause concern. But if it's a shallow well, even uh, having a fence 10 feet away, if they're around that and pooping around that, then it's likely uh, could be an issue. You certainly need to sample and see. Um, yeah. Um, our area was historically mined. Water testing is pricey. What metals should be most concerned about? And how often 
should we test our water? You know, this is something that I'm not very versed on. And so um, I would ask that you send me an email and I will uh, look into this. Uh, some of our staff have been involved with some of that issue at the survey and I'll have to reach out to them. Um, because um, mine drainage is certainly, you know, acid mine drainage is a big issue right now. And uh, depending on what was mined and, um, you know, those things, certainly if there's runoff that can affect near your well, um, you should be concerned. Um, it's not, yeah, I, I just need more specifics and I apologize, but I'm not going to try to answer a question I can't. Um, I'd rather spend the time and look into it. Can you provide any help to public transit, transient non-community systems? Okay, so transient non-community systems versus non-transient. For those who don't know, public water supplies are either non-community or community. Non-community systems can be either transient or non-transient. So a transient one is where um, at least 25 people, 60 days of the year visit it, but not the same people. So that could be uh, like a rest area or a gas station that has its own well. Um, a non-transient is a non-community system, but there's at least 25 people more than, I think it's 60 days a year, it might be more like 180 days a year, but that would be like a rural school or a rural factory or uh, a business that has that many people uh, where they're there every day, but it's not their residence. So anyway, so getting to your question, uh, most technical and financial assistance is only available to community systems, but it's the small transient systems that often need the most help to fall through the cracks in availability assistance. I totally agree. Um, and we, our private well program, actually, we were asked um, to provide a class for non for tra for non community systems, um, specifically on groundwater and wells. Um, we have a sister website, if you will called wateroperator.org. It's all one word, wateroperator.org. We've had this uh, in place for 12 years now, um, and it provides resources and training for all systems. You can search for non uh, community non-transient, and um, I certainly have more staff available to help as well. So if you go to that webpage, um, you can look up information, um, and depending on what state you're in, we can, uh, we, I work with the non-community managers, uh, we've actually developed this online class that's free that gives you CEUs if you're maintaining a license as a non-community system um, on groundwater and wells. It's it's basically a shortened version of our private well class because it doesn't get into the sampling or the treatment because those are covered under your primacy agency. But we certainly uh, can give you some help. Um, I've done a lot of work. I looked at uh, you know almost 20 years ago when the arsenic rule was going to change it was going to affect a lot of non-community systems in the upper Midwest. We have, you know, in the Great Lakes states, um, most of the non-community systems in the country. And so it was going to affect, especially states like Michigan and Wisconsin that have seasonal systems and a lot of summer uh, businesses. Uh, for tourists, uh, a lot of these non-community systems, um, I looked at what would change when they had to start sampling for the arsenic rule, and we thought a lot of them would go to public water. It turned out a number, uh, many of them closed, and it, that's really unfortunate. And so we certainly understand the issues there. So yeah, give me a, uh, any, send me an email, or you can call our line, um, or you can look up my information at the University of Illinois, Steve Wilson, uh, at the State Water Survey, and just give me a call directly. Okay. Uh, what uses can be made? if your well water is considered unsafe, unsafe due to nitrates, unsafe due to coliform, unsafe due to E. coli. Um, so if they don't wanna make it safe, then they really need to understand what the real issues are. So having coliform doesn't mean uh, someone's gonna get sick because coliform isn't the bacteria that makes you sick, it's E. coli. But what it means is there's a pathway into your well, that person's well, which means other things like E. coli or you know, fecal coliform, I guess, and um, or anything else, a spill. So they spilled gasoline nearby. It means there's a pathway into your well, and that's why it's unsafe. And so you're taking a risk anytime you drink it if any of those things happen. Um, you know, uh, for instance, arsenic. If you don't want to treat your water for arsenic and decide you're not going to drink it, is it safe to shower and 
bathe in, it is. It has to be super high. And I ran this by the Minnesota Department of Health is the only reason I'm willing to say it. But at normal levels that we see in groundwater, you know, less than 300, let's say, um, uh, arsenic isn't going to affect you. It'd have to be, you know, almost a powder that really absorb into your skin at that level, is my understanding. So it really depends on the constituent. But, you know, can you, if it's got E. coli and coliform or nitrates, can you irrigate with it or can you grow crops with it? Um, yeah. Can you feed livestock? I'd say, yeah, not milk. But, um, you know, a, a dairy farmer is going to know uh, what their water has to meet in order to be usable for, to make milk, uh, for instance. And organic farmers likely know that's where we're at in the stage of kind of our water quality evolution in our country is that some of these specialty things, uh, there's a lot of information already available and you can find that as well. Um, and you're always free to email us or contact me if you have a question and you're not sure. Um, and I don't know that I know I will have all the answers, but I can find them. So uh, yeah, we're glad to help. Uh, so with all the contamination sources, where do you start and end in testing? Organics, inorganics, how often? Um, yeah, it's certainly, I think uh, what we tell folks to do is um, understand your surroundings and land use. You know, like if I'm in an old, uh, if I'm in a home that's on an old set of, even if it's in a rural area and I'm near a corner where there used to be a gas station, then it's probably worth your time to test uh, for volatiles once to see if there's any risk or anything there. You know, and, I mean, there's different classes of those organics, I realize, and I don't work with them directly. So, um, uh, but you know, there's, there's volatiles, there's um, the ones that sorb, there's the ones that, uh, that yeah. So anyway, um, it's always a risk that you could be contaminated and not know is to test you infrequently. Um, but it, it is too expensive and, uh, and even more than hundreds or hundreds of dollars. We, we figured out at one point that if you sampled for everything under the Safe Drinking Water Act, which no one has to do because it includes both surface water and groundwater systems, right? You're not going to test for uh, the, the, algal, the stuff that algal blooms cause because you don't have algae in wells, right? Algae needs sunlight. Um, so you're not going to test for that. Um, for instance, but it's more important uh, to have a reasonable comfort that your well's safe. And to do that, you need to know your well's properly constructed, properly sealed. You've done all the maintenance and management things you can, uh, and you identified the sources around your well, which is one of the things that assessment does is you basically draw a map and you ask, are there any buried tanks here? You know, we had an upground, we had above ground, I grew up on a farm, we had an above ground gas tank. But I guarantee you, right around that tank, uh, there's uh, problems. Our well wasn't that close to it. Uh, so it's really, um, it's in its individual comfort. Some people would never be comfortable. But then those same people might not even be safe, feel like they're safe drinking from a public water supply and they're buying bottled water. Well, what people don't realize is that many bottled water sources our public water supplies. Uh, and it used to be before some of the rules were, they was just regulating bottled water, that some of the bottled water was less safe than public water. And so you really need to do your due diligence and understand those issues um, in order to feel better about what you're drinking. Um, I mean, you can always run an RO system or and distill your water and, and make sure there's nothing in it. But, you know, DI water, um doesn't taste very good to be honest not that that's the most critical thing if you're being safe but you know there's also not the inorganics and some of the things that your body does need you know um iron and some of the things you get from water which is a good thing okay uh, in southeast ohio testing every three to four years would have exposed the population to enormous health consequences no one knew so if you have a new contaminant source and wait years between testing, you're in big trouble, especially on publicized events or routine contamination. Well, we see that today. 
with uh, PFAS chemicals. Um, you know, it's not an exact science and, and no one has all the answers. So, uh, and that's, that's always gonna be a risk. You know, somebody could have spilled something near your well last year. Um, and if you're not testing for that particular chemical, you're never gonna know until, um, oh, I can't think of the book now and the movie they made, um, but it was about the, uh, I think it was a tanning plant in um, New Jersey or I can't remember where it was now. It was civil action. Um, thank you. Yeah, civil action. Um, that went on for how many years before anybody, not, I mean, it's a different world today than it was then. And they got away with a lot. Uh, and it caused how many kids to get cancer and all those things. Um, it happened here in the Chicago area too. Lockformer is a company. Um, I think it was uh, TCE contamination. And none of the state officials, they knew there was contamination, but they weren't that worried about it because it was in the very urban part of the Chicago metro area. And it was assumed everyone was on public wells. Well, come to find out, every one of those subdivisions in the Chicago area have boundary issues where one town uh, boundary butts up against another and all these little areas that are unincorporated. Uh, they have their own septics and their own wells. So it turned out there were almost 2,000 wells. There's, well, there's actually two to 3,000 wells in use in Cook County, Illinois, which is Chicago proper for most of it. So um, there is no solution for what you're asking. Um, there's not enough money available, just like really even with the lead problem. You know, if we could throw a trillion dollars at it, we could solve the lead in two years, but we don't have a trillion dollars to throw at replacing every lead service line, every lead pipe in every person's home, when until um, at least the 60s, or even later in some states, lead was the preferred type of pipe in homes. So, um, and I, I agree with your comment, but it's the, it's really, we feel it's the, you know, best advice to give folks um, in order to make it affordable and to understand. Um, and the type of situation you're talking about had to be in a large exposed population. Um, and so it's something, uh, some specific event but you know, I'm sure someone let the population down. Um, and I'd, I'd be interested to hear more about it. If, uh, you know, I've showed your comment so that everybody can see it. I'd like to talk more about it if uh, you don't mind emailing me. So, um, okay. What's the most e economical way to sample for pesticides? Uh, atrazine is used as a problem in groundwater and area. Um, you know, I don't know that there's an economical way. There are, you know, we've looked at, back in the 90s, we were doing a bunch of work looking at ag chemicals because uh, um, of pesticide registration in the states and EPA wanted to understand more about non-point source pollution. So our lab used some assay techniques that they developed, um, but we don't continue to do those. You know, there's still an expense to all that. And when we don't have requests for those type of samples very often, it's just not something we have the capacity to do. So some of the bigger uh, private and public labs can test for atrazine. You might ask them if they have more uh, different methods to test. I mean, in some cases we find out that labs are using assay techniques when they don't really tell the customer. And so they're not using the EPA approved method because it's not a compliant sample. And that's you know, another thing of advice if you go through our lab stuff, we recommend you ask the lab and make sure they're using the EPA methods as a um, accredited lab or certified lab, because some certified labs also use techniques that aren't certified and every particular constituent is certified differently. And so you need to make sure they're doing things those ways if that's what you want. Um, you can get a screening done using an assay technique a lot cheaper, um, but it's gonna give you a range or maybe it's color metric. Um, I don't necessarily recommend using any of the kits you can buy uh, in a store. Now, our lab manager, who used to be on these webinars with me and knows a lot more about this than I do, I retired in November and it's really put a, a damper on our ability to answer these questions. But one of the things he used to say 
is that for very common things like you find uh, that you test for in your aquarium, you know, like pH, um, those tests he would uh, he would say are okay to use. But for other things, uh, you know, there's just there's not necessarily a really economical way to do that um, because you can't have both a really economical way and then a lab that has to go through a certification process that costs them a lot of money uh, to stay certified where well, they have to recover those costs. So, um, and that's, again, just an unfortunate thing in the way it is. So, um, what should one do with a lot of sulfur in your water? Um, well, if it's sulfur, straight sulfur from a bedrock source, that's different than sulfur bacteria that cause the rotten egg smell. Um, and uh, I will have to uh, get that information to you. I didn't include that this time and I'd have to look it up. But um, I know if, if it's caused by sulfur bacteria, you can chlorinate to kill the bacteria and they're stubborn. If you have that iron bacteria in your well that uh, cause that sulfur smell, um, I just misspoke, I think, but it's iron bacteria that cause that rotten egg smell uh, if it's uh, in your well uh, and it's not a natural sulfur source. So, um, okay, yeah. So if it's iron bacteria, then you'd want to shock chlorinate and it may take several cases because they grow in layers. If it's sulfur in your uh, source water, then your best uh, option is to aerate. And so what folks, some folks have done is you have to add an extra tank to your line, basically. And so before you're, uh, so you, you put things in a tank that uh, can bleed off the air and that takes a lot of that smell out. And then you can also add uh, like a, I believe a carbon filter and I'll have to look that up. So please email me, that'll scrub the rest of that out, so to speak. And then you have a second pump there that puts it in your pressure tank and helps maintain the pressure to your system. And so it's not ideal, but um, you know what happens is that sulfur's in solution in the water and it's under pressure when it's down on the ground. And when you bring it up and expose it to atmospheric pressure, all that gets released, the sulfur dioxide, and it causes that smell uh, in your uh, water because it's a nasty smell, I agree. Um, one of my uh, uh, brother-in-laws who's a farmer has a well that has that sulfur smell and man, I don't, yeah, I don't even like to take a shower in it, but he's used to it, so. Um, what do you call a shallow well? Well, that's a very good question. And I've answered that on previous webinars because it really um, is dependent on your situation. You know, some people, we say shallow well is unsafe, and I know I use that term all the time, and a deeper well is, is safer, so to speak, but that's a, it's a sliding scale, and it depends on, uh, you know, if you're in a glaciated environment, whether there's uh, sand at the surface or whether you have clay at the surface. And when I talk about shallow wells, a lot of times I'm really talking about large diameter wells, the old type that are getting water from the water table. That's probably how I should use that to be more consistent. Um, but we also see drilled wells um, or hand-driven wells that are maybe less than 30 feet deep because it's all sand and the water table and the sand at the surface is the aquifer. And in those cases, it's direct infiltration. Um, there's, you know, direct runoff uh, that, you know, will seep in. Uh, there's a, it's a lot, if it's sandier soil, water can move through the soil quicker. And so the water table is always running towards a surface outlet like a stream or a river. And if your source is a, a higher th above that, so to speak, and your well is down towards the river from that, um, you know, you're likely to have those things show up in your well. And so there is no specific definition, but it just means it's susceptible uh, to surface influence, I guess would be the best definition. Okay. Hey, thanks for sticking around. I appreciate your time. Uh, here's the information. If you want to email us at info@privatewellclass.org, Katie monitors that I imagine every day. And if she gets any questions that I've asked for today, she'll forward those to me. And uh, you can also ask your questions about CEs, or if you just need a certificate. I know in some states you can provide a certificate, and then they'll approve the CEs after the fact. Um, and so, if, uh, if you want to do that or try that, you certainly can. Um, thanks again. Thanks, Katie, for your help. And uh, check out our webinar page to see what uh, our webinar is next month. I think it actually might be for environmental health professionals only. Um, but anyway, uh, thanks again. Everyone stay safe.